you very much indeed, Nicholas, and uh, thank you to the whole Capital Link team and Knut as well for um, today's session. Um, so as Nicholas says, the, the first session of the day is around energy security uh, and the energy <coughs> security landscape and shipping. Um, and really what we're going to dig into, because I'm joined by a, a, clearly a panel of experts today, is around what does energy security mean to shipping and how are companies reacting to that. Before we kick that off, it's probably just worth sort of setting the scene around, um, you know, the IEA's definition around energy security of an uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. So energy security clearly has two dimensions to it, the first of which is the long-term aspects, which looks at how do we deal with uh, timely investments to supply energy in line with economic developments and certainly environmental needs. But on the other hand, and I think the more pressing one that Hans has just sort of set the scene for nicely, is around the short-term aspects of this, and how do we look at the ability of the energy system to react promptly to sudden changes in the supply-demand imbalance. With much of the focus in recent years on the energy transition and the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which will be covered in some of the other sessions today, events certainly over the last 10 months have changed our perspectives and some of our priorities and has caused us as nations and organisations to re-evaluate some of our priorities associated with the investments that we're going to make and certainly reappraise decarbonisation ambitions. So within today's panel, we've got about 40 minutes together, and we're going to look at some of the risks and the opportunities um, to, to various different organisations uh, associated with the current energy security challenges that we have, its impact on shipping and how the situation may impact investment decisions over the years to come. So uh, firstly, I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of experts today, and I'm going to ask them without further ado to, to introduce themselves and just give a bit of an overview as to how their organisations are dealing with some of the energy security challenges <coughs> that we face. So starting with you, Eric, if we kick off uh, around the sorts of things that you're looking at. Um, thanks, Andy. So um, I've recently taken over as the uh, CEO for Herg LNG. Uh, we're in the FSIU segment. Um, and the FSIU segment has been developed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, leading up to this, you know, almost moment of truth in the energy security situation, where regas capacity now is the main bottleneck uh, that we have to overcome. Um, Herg, uh, as a company, has been in LNG shipping for about 50 years and started to develop the FSIU concept already back in 2001. And we had our SIVs uh, delivered in 2009 and 10, which were built for both shuttling and regassing. And we had our first FSU use, um, pure FSU use delivered in 2014. Today, we have a fleet of um, 10 modern FSIUs out of the 50 FSIUs available in the, in the global fleet. Um, in the beginning uh, and the first period of FSIUs, they were placed in typical, uh, you know, more exotic locations like Indonesia, Colombia, Egypt, etc. And until recently, very few assets have been placed in Europe, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and I think a great example and a tremendous success is uh, Lithuania. So the then president, Dalia uh, Grabojske uh, came back apparently from a meeting in Moscow back in 2012, so this is now 10 years ago, um, being very concerned about the dependence on Russian gas. Um, so they started a process which led to um, our vessel, which uh, was named with the becoming name Independence, um, was placed in Klaipeda uh, in 2014 and started operating and, and regassing. So the first thing that happened was that Russian gas price dropped by 20%, you know, which probably repaid the lease on the asset very quickly. Um, and today, Lithuania is fully energy independent. Uh, the vessel is providing all the natural gas to Lithuania, as well as supporting neighboring countries, Poland and, uh, and Latvia. Um, so this is essentially what we're now trying to solve for uh, Europe, but on a much grander scale. Um, last year, EU imported about 150 BCM of gas from Russia, about 50 uh, in Germany. Um, and uh, as we estimate, um, you know, to mitigate the shortfall of the gas, there's about 80 BCM of capacity now being built in Europe, about 30 to 60 in, Europe, in Germany, depending on uh, which projects will be realized. And this is through a combination of land-based terminals and FSIUs. 
Um, and since March, uh, 12 FSIUs have been put in contract in Europe, which is unprecedented in such a short period of time. Um, and our contribution is that we will have four FSIUs in, Euro in Europe uh, by this winter and five by next uh, summer, uh, with a combined capacity of more than 20 BCM, which is significant uh, and is why we think we're an important part of, of the solution for Europe. Um, so why have FSIUs been in such demand uh, in, in this situation? We think there's um, three main reasons. Um, so first of all, it's the speed. Um, so we will have the first two FSIUs ready for operations already by the end of this year. Um, second, it's the affordability. We estimate FSIUs to be 40-50% lower cost than uh, land-based terminals. And third, and maybe most importantly, it's the flexibility. So with FSIUs, you can, of course, remove them after there's no more need for them. Um, and also between contracts and even during contracts uh, with seasonality, you can trade them as LNG carriers. Um, so we believe these are uh, phenomenal assets. Um, we think there are more needed in, uh, in Europe. Um, right now, the global fleet is basically fully engaged. Um, also, new build yards are fully occupied until 2027. So the solution now is really to um, um, convert LNGCs. Um, so we see ourselves as the market leader, so that's what we're working towards, and we're also open for new um, FSIU uh, projects. Um, and right now, we're working very closely with our customers and partners um, to make uh, the assets we have operational as soon as possible. So that's the uh, German state, RWE, Uniper, Deutsche Re Gas, um, Total, and a lot of local partners, which is, uh, you know, behind uh, making, uh, making these operational and starting regassing for Germany and, uh, and Europe. Um, so, Andy, it's... Um, exciting, busy times ahead in, uh, in LNG and FSIUs. Thanks very much indeed, Eric. So I think it's, it's absolutely about the scale of demand now and also the pace of the demand as well to get those online. So thank you very much indeed for that. So Ted, turning to you, how, how are you considering energy security? Um, I think one of the interesting things for our sector, which has historically been quite a backwater compared to our big brothers here in LNG, um, uh, you know, shipping LPG has historically been sort of a very uh, niche business. It still is a bit of a niche business, but it has brought to the forefront the importance and relevance of propane and butane to solving um, the energy security issues and the decarbonization issues. Um, I think folks have now come to realize that LPG is definitely part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. It's uh, it's a bridge fuel, um, you know, and, and uh, maybe... Uh, highlight some facts that may or may not be well known to the group. Um, about 50% of world LPG goes into domestic use, heating and cooking. Um, it's great compared, you know, I would uh, personally, I'd love to have LNG at my house. I don't have LNG at my house, but uh, propane's a great solution uh, for uh, many parts of the world because uh, we don't need all the last mile infrastructure that LNG does. Um, we don't need... Uh, the very expensive shoreside terminals that uh, that LNG requires. Uh, and that's not to say anything bad about LNG, it's a wonderful product, but uh, propane and butane are great products for the emerging markets. And so as a result, you know, as we sit here today, um, you know, the largest importers in the world are not surprisingly China and India. And um, L LPG has enabled those, those nations to quickly make a transition away from biomass, coal, and other more environmentally harmful forms of energy uh, to improve the quality of life of their people. Um, you know, we've seen uh, well-documented increases in cases of, of uh, childhood asthma in a lot of these communities. There's just the innate danger of cooking with some of these biomasses in small enclosed spaces. So, um, you know, the advent and the growth of LPG um, around the world has been huge. Um, the next biggest sector is pet chems. And, um, there's sort of two sub-segments within pet chems. And uh, part of it is uh, within traditional steam cracking, and their LPG is sort of traded off with naphtha. Now, naphtha is obviously oil-based, so there are some environmental benefits and some energy security benefits to switching to LPG, but at the end of the day, in a tough business, uh, you're going you're gonna to do what makes the most profit uh, you know, at any given time, and you know, we certainly understand that. The other piece of uh, the petrochemical pie is, uh, for LPG anyway, is propane dehydrogenation, which is a direct, on-purpose way of converting 
uh, propane into propylene uh, without going through the steam cracking process. Uh, the beauty of this process is that it's, uh, the infrastructure is cheaper to build. Um, we love it because there's no competition from naphtha. But again, from an energy security and environmental perspective, it's a great way to go. So, you know, there are also other uses of LPG. We see it uh, clearly in auto gas in various parts of the world. Uh, we see it um, used in all sorts of industrial applications. Um, most recently here in Germany, we've seen Avonik, uh, a petrochemical producer, realize that uh, they didn't need to use LNG, which is obviously scarce uh, for uh, its steam production. They're able to uh, use LPG instead. So, you know, what we've seen, um, you know, since the advent of uh, the crisis in Ukraine is that, um, you know, there's been a big reset in terms of realizing that some of these formerly demonized gases, including LPG, including LNG, are now realized to be part of the solution. Um, we think that spells good growth for uh, our business. It certainly drives our investment thinking. Um, you know, like I, I think like, you know, any investment uh, in any of these uh, capital intensive commodity sectors, you know, it, you know, the price at which you acquire or build the assets is very important. The forward outlook on the relative commodity prices is, is really important. But given this sea change uh, that we've seen in thinking about um, the usefulness of, of, of uh, some of these formerly, you know, disliked hydrocarbon gases to the energy solution, you know, we see that those economics should fundamentally change in our favor over time and our sector's favor over time. And so, uh, we are, you know, pretty optimistic as we look ahead, and uh, hopeful that we'll continue to contribute to the global goal of, uh, of, um, you know, decarbonization. Thanks so much, Ted. So I think it is, you know, really reiterating what Hans said in in the intro mm. introductory session, which is we've got to use what's available to us today. That's right. Um, and then we can look at energy transition, et cetera, as well on the foundations mm. of energy security. So th thanks for that, Ted. So Soren, um, by no means last, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. Yeah, my name is Sören. I'm working with DLR and I'm in charge of the Institute for Maritime Energy Systems, where we essentially have the mission to develop technologies and contribute everyone in the industry to make shipping emission free. And um, we, we do that in, in a matter of ways. What we heard right now that, of course, we need to first look into what is available. How can we develop retrofit solutions that also last the 20 or 25 years that we have in mind? Um, and how long they should last on the vessel. And that's where we see in many ways still a lot of open question marks that people um, ask us, what should I invest in? What should I put as a technology onto my vessel? What should be the fuels that I should uh, basically um, uh, bid on that they will be available for the next 20 years? And what is actually safe to use? And that's the things that we look into. Of course, I'm a researcher by nature um, and kind of a naval architect. Um, and looking into the mechanical problems. But I try to get away, obviously, from the university for the reason of being much closer to the transfer into the industry and making use of these things that we can look into so that there is an actual benefit of that. And we do that essentially by, by trying to find out what um, would be the safest choice right now and maybe we, we, what we also do is we are, um, because we have a governmental mission where the government gave us this task to, to research topics on um, emission-free shipping, where we also play back to the government um, what they have to do in order to make that happen and to make that economically feasible. Because we, we have a lot of these discussions like, okay, why don't you improve this on a ship? Why don't you do that? And very often I face uh, the situation that they often don't know that there is much stricter requirements on the vessel than maybe on the truck that is operating the similar cargo but in a much smaller scale on the land. And that's something we try to help but we also develop roadmaps for how to change the infrastructure, for example, in Germany on whether we import the fuels, and that's something we look into as well. What are the concepts for that? How much fuel we need? How can we do that scalable so that we don't just fulfill the demand we have today with a fueling station, but that we can also gradually build that up? And what is maybe needed as an investment potentially also from the government so that uh, we can kind of not just get the ship to a German port or a European one and then it's there, but we need to get it to the end users. And how to do that and what infrastructure is relevant for that, we, we look into that through development of roadmaps and then discussions with uh, the governmental bodies to see what... Uh, 
uh, that they can actually get an understanding that it's not enough just uh, to have one nice project with one ship and a fuel cell on board and then there's a diesel driven truck crossing by uh, riding by on the road and then refueling that every now and then. Um, and then, of course, the biggest task we, we look into is to find the technologies that are really reliable and that if you put a fuel cell on a small vessel or you use hydrogen in your engine, that um, you will not destroy that within a few years, but you can use it for the 20 years you have in mind to usually use these assets. Thanks very much indeed, Soren. So I think what we're summarising here is that the energy transition and energy security are hand in hand. I mean, it's as simple as that. They're bimodal. So we've got short-term challenges and we've got some long-term aspirations as to how do we solve some of those challenges. Um, but Ted, coming back to you as far as Dorian is concerned, you've, just, you've got over just, what, 20 VLGCs at the moment. And it's basically a case of how do you see some of the major opportunities ahead? You know, things like trading of ammonia, trading of CO2, et cetera. And how is that affecting some of your investment plans, investment strategies, et cetera, at the moment? Yeah, it's it's uh, Andy. That's that's right. It's very topical. Um, so um, you know, clearly we see growth opportunities for the reasons I outlined within our core LPG business. But um, you know, we'd like to think that uh, we know how to ship various kinds of gas. And so uh, ammonia is clearly something that is um, really an adjacency. And in fact, our sector has been shipping ammonia for a long time. Now, with the advent of the United States as such a massive exporter of, of, of LNG and, and other NGLs, you know, that, that core trade that used to be from Yuzhny in Ukraine to Tampa in the U.S. Uh, sort of went away. Um, but nonetheless, there's actually a significant installed base within our sector of ships that are ammonia capable, including some of our own. Um, there is certainly an investment case to be made to retrofit uh, our, our modern, uh, the, the current sort of uh, class of VLGCs needs a bit of work to be retrofitted to carry uh, ammonia. Not a significant amount, but I think the big question, and it probably goes for a lot of the new energy sources, is, uh, you know, for, and, and ammonia is great, it's, but it's, okay, where's the shoreside infrastructure um, where's all the, um, you know, end use? Because again, it's not just shipping the product. Um, you know, it's even between LPG and LNG, you can't just, you know, flip a switch and all of a sudden go from burning LPG to LNG or vice versa. Similarly, you know, you need to um, be mindful of all the, um, you know, externalities that go along with moving ammonia. It's toxic, it's dangerous. Um, you know, unfortunately, there, there were um, not too distant future some, some deaths in, in Asia aboard a ship that was uh, moving ammonia because it's, it's dangerous. So, um, again, we see the opportunity quite clearly, but I think we need to see the rest of the infrastructure grow and come along. I think, uh, you know, another area that's quite interesting, of course, there's already a bit of trade in it now, is, is carbon dioxide. Um, we um, were following that segment with a great deal of interest. Again, there are... Uh, a number of different approaches to carbon capture and storage and disposal. Uh, shipping is certainly going to play a role. I don't think, you know, the transport of carbon dioxide is particularly technically challenging, but I'd defer to Professor Dr. Ehlers on that one. But I think it's, I think it's relatively uh, well understood at this point. But again, um, there are other aspects of the value chain. And so that they, they, they really need to be addressed before I'd say the somewhat simple aspect of shipping can be addressed. So that all informs, you know, our near-term decision making. So um, we are spending, uh, I'd say, for a shipping company, um, a reasonable amount of time and money in terms of, you know, basic understanding of the technologies and the evolution of the total supply chain of, um, you know, some of these gases. One that's better established in our world is ethane. The United States is really long ethane uh, in the current market. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to re-inject the ethane back into the LNG because of you know the obvious energy commodity arbitra price arbitrage. But nonetheless, uh, there's already a trade existing. There are already a number, not a huge number, but already a number of very large ethane carriers in the world. And we uh, that's an area we uh, know, understand, have been close to investing in, but haven't quite found the right opportunity. Um, but it's uh, it, it's it's one that you know, frankly, uh, technology has now come a long way. Uh, the great thing about ethane in the U.S. is it's really cheap. It's uh, 25 cents a gallon historically. Um, but on the other hand, it's expensive to move and it's expensive to store. And finally, I think technology has uh, brought the cost per unit down. And so we see that as a significant growth area. And, and in that case, unlike uh, CO2 and ammonia, the shoreside infrastructure and sort of the last mile has really come a long way. So we think that's a potentially really interesting area for growth. 
Um, you know, there, there's obviously all sorts of, um, you know, wonderful ideas out there for the future, but I'd say those are kind of the areas where we're spending our time these days. Super, thanks, Ted. Uh, Eric, coming to you. So, you know, having just joined Hogue from a long career in, in Wilhelmsen, um, you're, you're obviously looking at the key opportunities around LNG, FSRUs, as you articulated in, in your intro. But we have got some challenges there, haven't we, to ensure that we do have the supply and demand mix balanced in terms of we've got issues associated with shipyard capacities, as you said, you know, maybe not being able to build new units or even getting conversions uh, underway until maybe 2027 with the capacity within some of the yards. And what we're also seeing layered over that is regulatory change coming in with carbon intensity index, etc., that could put some of the existing LNGC fleets under pressure. How do you see the opportunities there and how are you combating some of those uh, aspects? Um, <clears throat> so you're right. I mean, it's the speed of creating capacity now, which is, uh, which is the main challenge. And if you look at the energy situation, Europe is pro probably okay for this winter um, with the storages being uh, close to full, uh, I guess 90% or whatever it is right now. Um, so we're probably good for this winter, but the challenge will be for the next couple of winters um, and creating enough um, regas capacity essentially within that time. I, I think from an LNG carrier perspective, there will be capacity. Uh, yes, the steamers will have an issue. I think with the current situation, there will be solutions um, to that, um, you know, with regulatory regimes or they will be traded where they're more uh, feasible. Uh, but there's also um, quite a lot of, uh, of new LNGCs coming to market over the next uh, few years. I think the capacity will, will be created. I think also um, the supply of LNG will be available, um, particularly from the US, where Freeport is now up and running again, um, and, and there's a, a good capacity, and from Qatar and in other places. So the availability of LNG will be there depending on the prices, of course. So it's really about this regas capacity. Um, the land-based terminals usually take time to develop, um, so that will take you know, three, four, five years. Um, so it's really how we can, can do it now on, uh, on the FSIU side. Um, I, as I said, I think the, the main route forward is to convert LNGCs, and that could be done probably in sort of 24 months um, from, from start to finish. So that's really the timeline that you're looking at to, to create uh, real new capacity. And then in between, maybe there could be some front-runner you know, solutions to patch it together. Um, but that's really the timeline. So this winter is okay. The next winter, I think, will be, um, will be really the issue that we need to solve. Super. Thanks, Eric. So, yeah, as we see some of the pressure from regulations associated with steam turbine fleets, DFDE fleets, etc., those are prime suspects for conversion to LN or FSIUs, etc., to solve some of the immediate challenges as we look to refill the fleets. So, Soren, coming to you, in, in terms of what does that mean in terms of a, an energy mix for ship systems, ship structures, etc., and how are you looking to, to address some of those challenges? Because we heard earlier, dual fuel is the answer. Uh, we hear a lot about dual fuel ready, um, but what does that actually mean in, in real terms? Yeah, for, for, let's say for us this means that, of course, we would like to serve a market need that um, if you have 0%, for example, methanol available, you can just use diesel. But if you have 100%, you could just use methanol, obviously, but it would be good, nice to run everything in between. And the problem somehow I see is that how do you get that certified or how much of the risk that the engine will actually accommodate these conditions uh, will work. And then if you go up to hydrogen at the end, that's another question. Um, and that's something we, we, we do in terms of testing on, um, in our laboratories and in also in our um, own research vessel just to collect data on that to know what can be done and what, uh, what should be avoided. Um, and of course, there's the technical challenges, how to control that if you use a different mixture and how maybe you have to make some modifications to the heads of the engine or alike. Um, and I would say that, that what, what I notice as a problem is that the conventional engine manufacturers, they usually want to deliver a foolproof product that they give out of hands if, and when they have really tested it and it's ready, the, the lubricants are working, they are classified and everything is there. But I don't see that we necessarily have the time to do that. I mean, if you just think how long you need to test um, each lubricant for each fuel mixture, we will not be able to do that before we release these products. Some companies already developed these engines, they are on the market, which is nice, but 
I'm not really sure how, how it looks with, when it comes to the reliability of them, when you actually operate them in all these possibly wild mixes that you have ad hocly available. And I think that's where we, we all need to do something and look into that further to make sure that we have to take some risks in order to start that quick enough and not just to let some people in the laboratory um, test that for the next 10 years before it's solidly available and you have all the stamps that you are used to and then you can go ahead. And if we wait for that, uh, we will just lose a lot of opportunities and time. And that may, of course, mean that something fails during operation. That is the problem. And I guess we all know that we are quite conservative in the shipping business and we want the others to do the mistakes first. That's why we are therefore as a testing laboratory to try to do these tests before they go out, but it's just not enough. I mean, that, that's one, one problem I think we all face. Conservative in shipping. I, I didn't know that. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, m moving on, I think what I would like you to do is each of you is to get your crystal balls out and basically sort of start looking at the future of energy dependencies. Basically, who's going to be the winners? Who are going to be the losers? You know, both in terms of fuels, um, I'm going to say in terms of infrastructure, in terms of locations, etc., um, without creating another energy crunch. So, we, how do we link energy transition back into energy security, not to create an issue? Um, but basically look as though we can start with a solid foundation to look at moving forward. So, Ted, let's start with you. Crystal ball time. Uh, over to you. Um, well, <clears throat> thanks for such an easy question, Andy. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I guess um, from, a, from a winners and losers perspective, um, uh, obviously I would not want to be, you know, one of the big uh, Rosneft or one of the other Russian LNG <laughs> that, that's That's pretty obvious, low-hanging fruit. Um, you know, I'd say that um, clearly the entire LNG, LPG world should continue to, to, to benefit. I think um, it's, you know, the, w the geopolitical aspects of, uh, of energy security kind of came into really stark relief earlier this year. So I think as, you know, a global world of energy consumers, um, people are going to be much more mindful of uh, the political implications of uh, where and with whom they source energy. Um, so I suspect that, you know, without making it too political, probably is uh, a good sign for, you know, any democratic nation in the world. Um, you know, I think in terms of um, infrastructure and, and, and not creating, um, you, know, uh, you know, bottlenecks, um, you know, I, th I think we, we'd expect to see continued growth in, 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 in our sector. I'm, I'm not uh, smart enough to look beyond our little backwater. Um, but I, I think in, in terms of some of the areas of the world that maybe have not been, that, that have resources uh, of LPG and related gas that haven't necessarily uh, strutted themselves on the world stage, I expect we'll see more of that. Um, you know, places like, again, maybe not, you know, a shining example of democracy, but Angola, um, Nigeria's come a long way in terms of building its infrastructure. They've got a lot of resources. Um, Algeria, uh, some of those emerging markets, because again, I think there's really good, not only environmental, but also social aspects, as well as just the broader uh, increase in, in, in you know, dispersion or lack of concentration of energy production. Um, I think we'll continue to see a um, place like Norway, which obviously has a bit of a uh, schizophrenic relationship with energy. Um, they've got a lot of it, but they, they, they like to punish people for using it. But um, we'd expect to see more of that, uh, you know, that, them becoming a bigger producer on the world stage. We do expect the U.S. to continue to do it, even though our current administration also has a bit of a schizophrenic relationship with energy, with hydrocarbons. Um, you know, and I think, um, you know, obviously looking out to the high growth population areas, um, you know, we expect to continue to see growth in, 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 uh, on the demand side in, in, you know, the traditional import markets. And, I, you know, I think, look, uh, China's going to be a winner um, in, in, in energy imports, uh, and they're going to play a significant role in whatever direction the world decides to go in. Um, but we also, we also have seen India grow very rapidly in LPG import infrastructure. We expect to see them uh, to be big winners, and we think Indian infrastructure be a, is a great place to invest going forward for LPG. Um, so I think I, th I think that's about as well as I can do. That's very good. No, very good. Good crystal ball. I hope everybody knows where they're going to invest now over the next couple of years. Um, Eric, moving to you, I think on the on the same question in terms of the winners, the losers, the change in geographies and dynamics. Good, challenging uh, question. Um, 
I think what we know is that future energy systems and infrastructure will be hugely complex with all these different uh, sources of energy. Um, so certainly I think the winners will be the ones that can provide very flexible solutions and that can quickly adapt as these uh, systems uh, are changing. And I think also the companies that are very actively contributing to the energy transition. Um, I think as the renewable energies will be growing, solar, wind, etc., um, it's going to be very important to develop, um, um, you know, backstop solutions that are very robust and solid. Uh, we think uh, gas can play a very important role in that. And I think from a gas perspective as well, that all the infrastructure which is already in place for for LNG um, really can be reused to other gases like hydrogen, uh, etc., which will be both, you know cost-effective and a flexible way of, of solving that problem. Um, so I think that's a challenge to us as well as an infrastructure terminal provider. It's really to see how can we use existing infrastructure and develop that into the use of, of new gases like hydrogen, um, at, um, uh, etc. So really huge opportunities happening, I, I think, over the next you know long, long term on hydrogen. Um, we've talked about ammonia which I think is another way of actually transporting hydrogen molecules from a maritime perspective. That's probably more interesting than, than pure hydrogen. Um, so we'll see a lot of developments, um, you know, but there will be, um, I think, room for, for a lot of different players in this complexity. Thanks, Eric. So, uh, Soren, from an academic perspective, we've heard about West Africa, we've heard about Guyana, we've heard about Mozambique, we've heard about Qatar in terms of this changing energy mix. How are you seeing that in terms of how that's going to pan out around ensuring that we have energy security for the long term? I like, I, what, I like the wording that Eric chose a lot, that uh, he used flexibility. From my perspective, on the technology side, I would say we need really modular systems that can cope with all these different mixtures that we will have available. If you bet everything on one uh, horse, then you will probably lose something. So you need to be able to cope with these differences and also the differences in qualities that come out. We have for many of these alternative fuels no real regulations or for hydrogen. It, it, we all call it hydrogen, but we don't necessarily um, know what, what quality that will be that comes from different places and whether your uh, energy converter can utilize this in the same way and still reach its lifetime. So that is something um, that you really need to watch out for and make sure that there is the flexibility and the modularity in the system to possibly change something easily and not to be too rigid in the entire still very complex um, energy system that you will have on board. Um, when, it, when it comes to um, where these alternative fuels could come from, how then Let's say from a geopolitical part, I'm not really an expert there. What, what my interest is, is how, do we, how can we safely transport it and what could be a reasonable way to do that? And I, I have the feeling that a lot that is going on um, is kind of ad hocly forming. Obviously, from my view, where we are also looking for where there is funding available um, from uh, from the governments, then there may be a lot of things that kind of pop up, but then they don't materialize in full. And that I find a little bit critical. So to join forces there and to really also as the industry to, to say that, okay, we, we have to get a little bit away from those usually unique vessels that are all a bit different so that we have our better market position with them but maybe we need to kind of here form some better standards to say that this is what we all want to have and see and then join efforts because I still think the piece I mean the overall cake is big enough for everyone to benefit from that and to avoid having to build up small terminals or like a hydrogen gas station we had in Hamburg that had to close down because the running cost was higher than the income that was created. So that makes no sense, but that is what can happen. And if we are only looking at the big picture to get something to a large terminal, then it's also not enough. We really have to get everything to the end users and consider their market needs. Um, and, and then also see where maybe does it make the most sense to save emissions from my perspective at first um, and, and I think that would be really important to kind of try to harmonize that and have a good also legal framework around that from a classification society perspective to what the governments think what you have to comply with and also to maybe somehow make these possibilities on how to build up a terminal much quicker. I mean you have ridiculous rules in, in my mind. I mean we are building up a, a tank base on our premises and 
everything below five tons is okay-ish. Yeah? I mean, if you do testing with hydrogen, if it's below one liter, no one cares. But what is one liter? So, and still one liter can kill you easily. So it's not a problem, but no one cares. If it's a bit more, then it's a problem. If it's below five tons, the regulations on the emission side and everything is also very easy. But above that, it's the same whether you have 5.1 tons or 50,000 tons. It doesn't matter anymore. And, and there has to be some changes to be also quicker so that the response times are faster. Um, and if that happens, then I would think that it could be quite beneficial for many. Sorry, and thanks for that. And I think you've, you've brought up an, a really interesting point around the changing relationships between the stakeholders associated with traditional contracting, traditional regulation, traditional classification, and the way that relationship is changing. Yeah. Eric, probably coming back to you, because I think you, you hit a, a, the nail on the head, the accelerated pace of change that we need to go through and are going through now in terms of contracting that could have taken possibly 12 months, 18 months worth of negotiations is now taking two months, for example, to get FSRUs under, you know, sort of contract effectively. Do, do we still believe that the policymakers are doing enough mm. to move fast enough to enable us to uh, address some of the challenges that we immediately face with energy security? Mm. You know, I'd first like to say that, we, you know, we're hugely impressed with the German government, particularly in how they very speedily um, took action earlier this year. Um, so very quickly, they put in place contracts for four FSAUs. That was done in six weeks. You know, that are projects that typically take, you know, a couple of years. Incredible. Um, mm -hmm. So it was an incredible pace mm -hmm. uh, that was put in place. Um, and also, uh, right now, uh, on the ground, when we're putting in place the projects, we're seeing the impact of the LNG Acceleration Act, which, you know, which is actually working also on the ground. You know, that doesn't mean there's plenty of challenges to, to be overcome, but I think that sets a, sets a very clear direction for, um, uh, for this being done. Um, I'd also like to highlight the, the Dutch government, um, you know, which has also been, you know, maybe even more aggressive on, on implementation. So we're seeing implementations of projects happening there now, even before permitting has been made. So they're allowing implementation before permitting. And they're also um, securing financing and, and providing guarantees um, ahead of projects being commercialized. You know, so it's, um, I think if we go a year, a couple of years back, we wouldn't think that would be possible, but that's actually happening. So I, I think that's quite impressive. And I think what uh, we've also seen now is that beyond the governments, um, there are so many different parties involved in making this happen. So we're working with federal government, with local authorities, with utilities, energy companies, EPC companies, um, ports, um, equipment providers, and asset providers. So it's... Uh, it's a huge system of different types of companies and players that really need to work together to make this happen. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to you know, take away some, some huge learnings uh, from that and, and how to do that even better in the future. But it's, um, it's actually working. Yeah. <laughs> Good to hear. No, I think that's fantastic. Um, so look, we've all said that LPG, gas, oil, et cetera, are now here as, a, a, as an answer to energy security issues. Whilst we look at the bimodal aspects of looking at energy transition to the future fuels, ammonia, hydrogen, et cetera, which we'll get addressed later. Carbon capture, methane abatement, issues that we face associated with the current fuels that we use today. Sorry, and I'm going to come to you for this one. Do you think we're doing enough around these things to ensure that we have longevity and we don't, um, let's say, create a bad name for shipping by just going back to the old fuels? Um. I think yes and no. I mean, in, I, I find it fascinating why ships often have such a bad reputation when it comes to emission, because we are not doing that bad. I mean, it's another question that we put 100% of energy in and maybe only 20 to 25% go as propulsion into the water. That's bad. Um, so that's something we, we, we can, I mean, it's obvious that you, we want to improve on that. Um, what I also find fascinating now from a, from a scientist perspective that we have a lot of ideas and solutions that we would like to get out, but um, they would simply cost too much. And they, they, they are not viable or economically feasible as long as the system does not change that, that you who operates the ship or to transport the fuels could actually get more money for transporting them. 
So if, if there would be a mechanism to, to change that and give everyone who goes into this transition a benefit from going there, then we could additionally accelerate the whole process because there would be room to, to do even more. But now, I mean, who wants to invest into an emission-free energy system if there's nothing coming back? I mean, it only costs you more. It's maybe unreliable for now, and you are essentially losing money. So th th that's a problem. And if the other person with a 40-year-old vessel next door is not doing that, and he, um, he, he will make nice money today. So, so that has to change. And there needs to be better regulations for that. And they should be, in my mind, even harder. I mean, not penalizing the, the current system so much that most people will get out of business because they can still not afford it. And maybe there are no savings. So I'm not an economist on that part. But I see there's a lot of potential if you can just increase the freight rates by a fraction. I mean, a few percent more and that you could invest into the systems that we, we are developing and the industry is developing, that would help a lot. Thanks very much indeed, Soren. And I'm just seeing that we're just running out of time in this panel. So what I would like to say is uh, please do join me in saying a huge thank you to our panelists in a second. But I think we've set the scene, I hope, nicely for the rest of today in terms of that the pace of change is um, something that's unprecedented. The scale of the change that is ahead of us in terms of addressing some of the energy security issues is enormous. It's going to take multi-stakeholders um, from very different, um, let's say, factions that we've seen within shipping before. Um, but I think we can see that companies are up for the challenge. Um, and I think this has got to be a collaborative approach to ensure that we can address these uh, challenges ahead of us. Uh, but with that, please thank uh, Ted, Eric and Soren for a wonderful panel this morning. Thank you, chaps. Thank you.